Hello and welcome and thank you for being part of WorkSafe's webinar today, how to prepare a safe work method statement for high risk construction work. My name is Cameron Ling and I'll be your host today. It's great to have you with us. Today, I'm going to be joined by Rick Fisher, WorkSafe's Industry Education Officer. He is responsible for attending TAFEs and informing students of their health and safety rights and obligations, including how to develop and follow a safe work method statement. Thank you for joining us today, Rick. Thanks, Cameron. It is great to have you with us. Uh, we're going to get through lots of content today. In the in the first half of our session, we'll cover information for businesses in the construction sector to help you understand how and when to prepare a safe work method statement for high risk construction work. And then we're going to open it up to you, the audience, to, to ask any questions that you've got. You'll see on the right hand side of your screen, that's the chat box. Please, anytime you like, enter questions in there and then hit enter. And that way I'll have them ready to go to ask on your behalf. Let's get straight into it. If we could please, Rick, safe work method statements are pri primarily used in the construction sector as a document that gives specific instructions on how to safely perform an activity that is considered to, high, to be high risk construction work. The statement is developed by work teams undertaking high risk construction work a task or process and provide detailed guidance on how to carry it out safely. In Victoria, it is law to develop a safe work method statement prior to high risk construction work commencing. Refer to it, review it and update it when required. So Rick, could I ask you to give us a brief legislative background to set the scene about the broad obligations employers have? Yeah, thanks, Cameron. Uh, so as Kim said, we're talking about SWIMS today and under the Occupational Health and Safety Law in Victoria, employers have a fundamental duty um, and the word so far as is reasonably practicable to provide and maintain for their employees a working environment that's safe and without risk to health. So this fundamental duty supports other more specific duties, such as the duty to provide a safe work method statement the duty to maintain plant, the respective duties to provide information, instruction and training, and to supervision to employees to enable them to perform their work safely. Thanks for that scene setting there, Rick. Uh, we're talking today about providing two different types of information, instruction and training. The general duty under the OHS Act and the duty to prepare a safe work method statement known as SWIMS, as you, you mentioned just before, What's the difference between the two? Uh, so basically, the general duty to provide information, instruction and training is not necessarily limited to high-risk construction work. Uh, it might include things on how to safely wear a, a dust mask or to use a nail gun or a power tool, any of those type of activities that aren't deemed under the recognised high-risk construction work activities. Okay, that makes sense. I, I I think I can see the difference there. So re it's recognised that construction is a hazardous environment, but there are 19 activities legislated as high-risk construction work. I understand that a SWIMS is required to perform high-risk construction work and it is a legal requirement of employers. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, look, I've got a short animation here that might help to describe it. So we might just play that now for our audience. A safe work method statement or SWIMS is a legally required document that must be completed before commencing specific high risk construction activities. The OHS regulations have identified these 19 activities as they have a long history or recognised high potential of causing death or serious injury in construction work. A safe work method statement should should clearly outline the high-risk construction work to be carried out, the hazards that could arise from these activities, and how you will control those risks. Swims don't have to be large and complex. They should be easily understood by all people involved in the task and remain readily accessible to them while the task is undertaken. To make it easier for your business to create a safe work method statement, visit worksafe.vic.gov.au and download WorkSafe's new SWIMS template. You can also find resources and helpful information on completing your SWIMS. 
Completing a swims before commencing high-risk construction work is not just a legal obligation. It also allows your team to think about the tasks, understand the risks, and approach them as safely as possible. And that leads to safer workplaces all across Victoria. So Rick, could I ask you perhaps to just go into it a bit more, the difference between a swims and a general duty? Yeah, absolutely. So a safe work method statement or a SWIMS is a legally required document that must be completed before commencing any of those specific high risk construction activities. So there's 19 of those and you can find those under Reg 322. So if anyone's looking for light reading, it looks a bit like this and it's probably easier to look at our guidance that we'll talk about in a little while. So under those, some of the things that are commonly used are work above two metres, work on um, energised electrical circuits on or near them, things like mobile plant movement. And the primary, primary purpose of the SWIMS is to help supervisors, workers and other people involved at that workplace to understand the requirements of what's being carried out and how to actually uh, establish and carry out that work in a safest possible way. So as discussed, the general duty uh, to provide information, instruction or training may include other tasks around that aren't specified as part of that 19. And as we said before, so things like putting a uh, dust mask or using a nail gun that still have risk, but they're not considered in that high risk category. I understand, Rick, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that SWIM's guidance and the template has just been updated by WorkSafe. What do employers need to know that's new? Okay. Um, so it's actually quite exciting, this new guidance. We've had a team work on that. And the things that we really wanted to achieve out of it was to get simpler language, to make it more straightforward and provide a step-by-step -step approach and we end up with an editable template on a, in a PDF format that employers and supervisors can use. That certainly sounds helpful. So whose responsibility is it to prepare a SWIMS before commencing high-risk construction work? Uh, okay, so the, the answers are a little bit rounded, so I'll just go through them. The, the employer has a, a duty to, in, to make sure um, that the employee is intending to undertake the high-risk construction work have actually prepared the swim prior to it commencing. Uh, when it's a self-employed person, uh, if they or their engaged contractors are intending to undertake high-risk construction work, they have a duty to prepare it. Labour hire. Labour hire is a little bit tricky because you have duties both with the labour hire employer and the host employer of the, of the employees on site. In practice, though, what we normally see and what we're looking for is that the people that are most familiar with that activity that's being undertaken should come together and develop that SWIMS. And that includes the affected employees, health and safety reps, and it may also be other supervisors or affected workers on that site. So what are the duties under SWIMS? What should employers remember here? Okay, so the duties for an employer and self-employed persons, that the swims must be prepared prior to the work commencing. So it's not get halfway through, oh, let's do a swims. We do it before we start. And the high-risk construction work is then prepared in accordance with the swims. So the high-risk construction work, if it's actually deviating from what's in the safe work method statement, that work actually needs to stop immediately and people take a step back have that bit of a breather, have a look at what they're doing and reassess and either modify the swims to how the work is can be done in a safe manner because of what's changed or change the work to come within the boundaries that the swims have described. Uh, the duty holder in consultation um, with the affected employees and their representatives, they need to actually make sure that the risks are actually being ad adequately controlled. Uh, the duty holder needs to maintain a copy of the swims for the duration of that high-risk construction work, and that should be available on site. Uh, and it should be available for the people that are actually doing the work. So if something changes, they can then modify it. So it can be kept in an electronic form or in a paper form. So how do you go about preparing a swims? 
That's a great question. And look, the steps are actually pretty straightforward and the new guidance actually makes that a bit easier. So we've got a slide here that uh, discusses that. We might bring that up. So what we need to do is first bring together the relevant employees, which is the ones that are going to do the work and have buy into how that work's going to be performed. And with the HSRs and their supervisors, preferably actually at the site where the work's going to occur. They need to then review the work and consider if any of the site-specific factors could impact the works. So it might be that particular site has poor access or has unlevel ground, so they may need to change how they're going to access something. Uh, it could be weather conditions have changed or they're more exposed than they thought they were. And it's then going through all of the high-risk construction activities are identified that are going to be done at that site and then selecting the risk controls alongside them that each of those has its have. So it's a bit of a straight line relationship. So we've got the risk, what the control is, how it's going to be implemented and who's responsible to do that. Uh, they then assess and review the, the swims at any time. If there's a major change to the risk on site or to the conditions or if the scope or weather or such things as weather have changed, and those amendments can be made uh, handwritten or if it's an electronic copy, it does need to be editable. And so they can edit that on site. You've mentioned, Rick, to control the hazards of high-risk construction work, employers yeah. should use the hierarchy of control, which is a recognised system used in industry to minim minimise or eliminate exposure. But how does this work? Uh, that's a great question. And look, I've got another graphic we might bring up just to, to explain it a little bit. So the first one is elimination, and that's just to eliminate so far as the risk is so far as reasonably practical. And it may be as simple as we just, is it, can we not do the task in that way or is there another way to do it that eliminates that risk altogether? As an example, rather than working at a height above two metres, can the work be done from the ground using other devices? Uh, the remaining risk, though, what we want to look to is the rest of that hierarchy. So can we substitute, and that might be if we're using a hazardous product, can we use a less hazardous product? Can we uh, isolate, so as an example, install concrete barriers to protect people working near traffic? Engineering controls, and the, this is uh, a classic one for this, is where we're doing trenching. So can we use battering and benching? which is a, a method of controlling the risk of a collapse or shoring the sides of the excavation using trench shields. At that point, if there's still a risk remaining, we can start looking at things like uh, admin controls, which can be signage, those types of things. And if it still remains, then it comes down to personal protective equipment. And I like I always try and remind people that PPE is it's the lowest form of protection. So we really want to be looking at those higher order controls and what's above the line. So what are the things like elimination, substitution, engineering that can really control that risk so it doesn't put the person in that state where they can be harmed in the first place? Thank you for explaining that, Rick. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and another question on this, can a SWIMS address matters other than high risk construction work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we might just bring another slide up here. So only hazards that are directly related to high-risk construction work need to be included on the swims. But often it's helpful to have some of those other less hazardous activities also included. So what we, we look at there, and I think we just flip to the next page of our graphic if we can, and there's room... Uh, under uh, the, the high-risk construction ones to then add other items. So such things as hazardous manual handling is a, a common example that people may want to have a control in place, and that might be using a lifting device as an engineering control that saves somebody ruining their back by lifting up uh, heavy bags of concrete, things like that. So, um, And those can be added, but what we ideally want to see in the swims is the high-risk construction work to be added at the top. So when you open it and they start reading, that's what they see first. Let's control the biggest factors and then look at the other ones below them. Rick, what about a generic swims? Uh, what, what is it and is it is acceptable to use one? Yeah, look, that's a great question. That's one we're often asked uh, out in the field. 
Uh, a generic swims, it's pre-prepared swims that seeks to address a whole range of hazards related to a specific high risk work and Oh, sorry, high-risk construction work. Um, it, it, one as an example would be somebody working at heights above two metres. Uh, a generic swims would quite likely have things like listed that we want to have work done from the ground if possible, if they have to be above two metres. We, we want passive fall control in place in the way of guardrails, scaffold, void protection, all those type of things. So those hazards and those controls would normally be applicable to most jobs. What we do need to do, though, is that that generic swims needs to be reviewed for the actual on-site. Uh, so each site is different and has its own hazards. So having a generic one's fine as long as it's still um, the time's taken to review and address the specific hazards on-site. What advice would you give, Rick, to smaller construction operators who might claim that swims are complex and not easily understood by workers? Yeah, and look, this is a pretty common thing, Cameron. Um, the first thing I would say is keep it super simple. So let's use the KISS principle. Um, what it needs to do, we still follow the same steps as we would for, uh, for more complex swims. We still use the guidance and the template. So the template's really simplified and we step through those things one at a time, identify the site, identify the risks, run through what the controls are, who's going to implement them, how that's going to look and who has a responsibility and a duty around it. Often a swims only needs to be one or two pages. It doesn't need to be 40 or 50. What resources, Rick, does WorkSafe provide to make it easy for employers to create a safe work method statement before they commence the high-risk construction work? Yeah, sure. Uh, if we bring that graphic back up again, it just shows us um, we've got, sorry, a graphic here that addresses it. And the the new template basically has the high, the guidance listed within it. It also talks about what those 19 activities classified as high-risk construction work are. It talks about who's got duties with the swims and who must prepare it. it talks about how to prepare it, including setting up the risk control measures, what needs to be included and what may not be included. Um, a, a simple one that quite often people put a risk matrix in their swims it's really not required because it's very subjective. So take some of those things out, makes it much easier to then just say, here's the risk, here's the control. Does it, are we happy that it satisf satisfies the, it's reasonably practicable and that it's actually controlled that risk of harm? Fantastic, Rick. I really appreciate uh, all of your uh, information and insights today. I'm keen to get to some questions because there's a lot coming through uh, on Slido. Um, so I'll jump to those if you're you're happy with that. Yeah, sure. Let's get stuck straight into it. A lot of people asking this first question here, Rick, so I'll go straight to that one. Yeah. Are swims required for other industries? We aren't in the construction industry, but we do some of these high-risk activities. Look, that's, that's a great question. And what the regulations talk about is that it is specific to the construction industry or if it can be deemed to be a construction site. Uh, my personal feelings about it, which may not be all of work safe, is that if you're doing those activities and you're going to do a swims, it's not going to hurt you, it's going to help you. So, But we still stick to the same principles is keep it simple, have the people involved and then put in controls to protect the people doing the work. Great advice that I think there, Rick. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, again, a lot of people asking this one, um, and I might need your help with a couple of the uh, the different um, sure. abbreviations or acronyms. Uh, what is the difference between a JSA, a yep. JSEA, and a SWIMS? Why not just use the one template? Um, yeah, look, that's a that's a pretty fair question. Uh, JSA. <clears throat> Excuse me. A JSA is what was really industry standard in the past, and a JSA is a job safety analysis. Um, a JSEA is job safety and environmental analysis, and really, that's quite often what we're doing without even thinking about 
um, calling it a SWIMS or anything else. And it's about the risk assessment. So it's looking at the site, identifying the specific hazards, and then putting controls in place. We can certainly use the SWIMS template to do all of those things. So if in doubt, you're better to have it in a SWIMS than not have it in a SWIMS. But as we said, if we always try and put the high-risk construction work that's identified at the top, so we address those those concerns and put those controls in place first. Um, this one here, Rick, uh, it's, it, I think it's going to—it's a bit of a tricky one, um, and I suppose a bit of clarity that a lot of people are asking: yeah. Do I have to sign on to a swims? Could this make me liable? Can you answer that? Okay, um, so the answer is you have to sign on to a swims if you are part of the work group undertaking the high risk construction activity or you're the supervisor of the people doing that. Uh, if you're just somebody else on the site and you're not related to that high-risk construction work, you don't need to be signed onto that SWIMS. Uh, as far as liability goes, uh, what we're looking at is if you're conducting high-risk construction work and you have a SWIMS in place, but you're not signed onto it, you're actually in breach because you've not been considered to have been inducted into those swims, which is part of the process of, of building a swims and implementing it. So you're better to be signed on the not. And the other thing is if you're involved with the swims and something goes wrong and the swim, swimmers is deemed to have had all reasonable, reasonably practicable controls in place, then that's more likely to be looked on favourably than if you didn't have a swims and you weren't signed on and you've just gone ahead and done the work without any due diligence or evidence of showing that you've put some thought into what you're going to do. That makes perfect sense, Rick. Thank you for that. Um, this one here is just after a bit of clarification because I think you mentioned 19 high-risk tasks. Um, a couple yeah. of people asking, isn't it 20 high-risk tasks now that silica has been added to high-risk? Yeah. And look, certainly silica is considered to be a high-risk construction activity. The thing is that hasn't actually been updated in the regulations in that particular listing of the under 322 of the activities. If it was me filling out a swims and there was uh, a risk of creating respirable silica, uh, then I would certainly be including it in my swims and including the controls. We do have separate guidance around uh, silica and what we can do is refer people to look at that. And I recommend they do look at our website around the, the whole risk around sil uh, respirable crystalline silica. And for people that aren't aware of what that is, that, that's basically sand particulate matter that's create, created at a really fine level. So we're talking microscopic and it can then be ingested or inhaled when you're working and can damage the lungs, causing a disease called silicosis, which is a really nasty thing. And anyone who wants uh, a little bit more information about that, um, another the webinar a little bit later today at 12 o'clock, um, we're doing a session on regulating exposure to crystalline silica and prioritising employees' occupational health if you'd, uh, if you'd like to join in again at 12 o'clock for that little bit more information there. Um, back to the questions, uh, Rick. Sure. Uh, how is the quality of the swims controlled? Uh yeah, quality is often subjective. It comes back to that term of reasonable practicability. And within, within the Act, it talks that a, an employer must do everything that's reasonably practicable. So when we look at quality, it's about saying what's known. So what's the knowledge around the industry? So if I'm going to put somebody on a second-story floor and have no guardrail, but I, I say we'll just put a bit of the red and, yellow, red and white tape around the outside... Okay, that's a visual marker, but does that actually stop somebody going over the edge? So straight away you can see, yeah, okay, practically that's not going to work. So it's not an effective control. So the controls need to be effective. They need to reduce harm and reduce the risk of harm. And they need to be, uh, cost does come into it, but cost is the last thing that we expect to be considered. So if somebody needs to spend a million dollars to protect a $1,000 job, then obviously it's not reasonably practicable. 
Uh, might be for Elon Musk, but not for you or I. Uh, the other one that we might think about is that if that knowledge around what's available is fairly common, then that's what we'd expect to see put in place as a control. Fair enough. Uh, that's good advice there. Uh, next one here, and this one's just jumped up um, to a lot of people asking this one, Rick, so I'll, I'll go yeah. straight to it. We use safe operating procedures for a lot of our tasks. Do we need a safe operating procedure and a SWIMS or is a safe operating procedure enough? Uh, that's a great question. And look, a safe operating procedure for general duties and general duty activities is absolutely spot on. And I would, I love when I work up, walk up to a work site and we have a chat to the guys and they can pull out a book of safe operating processes for all their general duties. And then they have a SWIMS that's addressing only their high risk construction work. To me, they're complementary, they're not exclusive. So, uh, sorry, not mutually exclusive. So quite often we would have both and would see both. Where we put things in a SWIMS that are a general duty, effectively that's a safe operating process at that point rather than being the safe work method requirement. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Yep. Great. No, thank you for clarifying that one. Um, are there any typical examples and or training programs and videos that show how the process is actually done, how they are documented and issues that might come up? Yeah, there certainly are. There have been some, uh, and I refer back to our website, that we do have guidance there. Uh, there's certainly WorkSafe Victoria have some YouTubes out and about that talk about preparing swims. And we've had some animations and other things produced, certainly in line with the new campaign and with the new guidance that's been produced. So, but I, I still go back to the main thing, keep the people involved that are gonna do the work, keep it simple, risk control, who's responsible and have we controlled that risk. Uh, this one here, maybe again, you can uh, just clarify it, please, because a yeah. few people are asking it. Safe Work Australia has an example swims for a high risk construction work task with control hierarchy, persons responsible, safe work methodology, et cetera. Why doesn't Safe uh, Work Safe have this? So, in our new guidance, the, the first uh, line of the, I think it's the second page that we had, actually has a worked example on that first line showing exactly that. And it's one, uh, I believe it's Scott Falls from Height. And it, and I can actually I'll just refer to a note here that's in front of me. So we've got within that, um, yeah, so there's one for roof tiling, just as an example, and it shows the sort of things that we'd expect to see with that. It talks about what shows how, how you can list the hazard, what sort of controls can be done, how they're going to be implemented, and who's got that responsibility again. So that worked example is actually there. Uh, there are some industry swims available as well, but they're not work safe's um, output. So we, we will always refer you back to our guidance. Great. Thank you, Rick. Um, lots of questions coming through. I will endeavour to get to as many of these questions as I possibly can. Um, do I need to include hazards that are not deemed high risk? You might have touched on it before, but can you yeah. clarify that one, please? Yeah, look, I think we've covered that a little bit. So they, they become the things that we talk about as general duties. So things like um, using power tools, things like using a nail gun, uh, hazardous manual handling, they can all be included in a swims, but they don't have to be. And they, they could then either be, as we spoke about before, a separate safe operating procedures that sit um, alongside the swims, or they can be in the swims, but lower down under the high risk construction work. Right. Um, keep going with just clarifying a couple of things here, Rick. Um, yeah, sure. You, you met, we, we just spoke before about JSAs and JSEAs. Um, yeah. A couple of people asking, will JSAs and JSEAs become redundant? People are getting confused as to when to use it. Yeah. Look, you can pretty much just use a, a safe work method statement. Um, and if you're using that as part of your risk assessment to say, well, what are the hazards on site? And this is what it comes back to. It's doing that initial risk assessment. And 
A swims actually lends, certainly with our new template, it lends to using that to do that risk assessment for the site because it's looking about um, the JS in job in JSA and JSEA is job specific. So when you walk up to that job, what's specific to this site that's a risk and how are we going to deal with it? Great. Uh, continuing on about SWIMS, should legislation and Australian standards be mentioned in SWIMS? Uh, the legislation actually underpins the SWIMS. So the legislation that we talk about is the Work Health and Safety Act of uh, 2004. And I think the late, latest release was uh, earlier this year in 2022. It's a little book that... Um, Looks a bit like this. It's a bit more light bedtime reading. If you've got insomnia, it will certainly help. Uh, but the the main thing there, and it, what underpins it, is really Section 21. But then Section 21 through to 26 talk a lot about the duties of employers, duties to others, people in management and control of sites. So that, that's what underpins it. And then the regulations are more specific around particular activities and such things as safe work method statements. So within safe work method statements, uh, regulations 324 through to 328 will actually cover the requirements around the swims. Great. Thank you, Rick. Um, do we need to have the swim signed every day to verify that the controls are in place? Uh, okay. If something's changed, yes. So the best way to do an, ex an example is we walk up to a site, we're going to be there for three or four days. The hazards through that three or four days don't change. If, every, if you've signed on on day one and nothing's changed, there's no need to review it. If something has changed, then yes, you would review it and then re-sign on to it. So that you only need to sign on uh, again when something's actually changed on the site or if there's been an incident and they would then review to say, well, was there something in the swim we can change to reduce the likelihood of that occurring again? A lot of people asking this one, Rick. Yeah. If a subcontractor undertakes high-risk activities without a swims and someone gets hurt, yeah. is the principal contractor liable for it? Okay, um, so this goes back to the duties. So the principal contractor has a duty to ensure that a swims has been prepared prior to high-risk construction work being undertaken. So if that principal contractor is in management and control of the site, they then have a duty to ensure that that swims is prepared. So yes, they would have a liability, in my understanding, um, in that situation. Uh, as would the subcontractor for for undertaking work without a safe work method statement in place. Great. Thank you for that, Rick. Um, uh, again, a lot of people asking this one. If the contractor writes the swims, what is the employer's options for controls to identified risks? Okay. So this one can be a little bit tricky and, and it's actually a really good question, something to think about. So quite often a principal contractor, as an example, um, a, a builder is the principal contractor in this instance, and he's brought in a, a welder to do some structural steel on, on site. Now, what the builder can reasonably understand is that there's going to be weight, there's going to be things used at height, they may need to have a crane on site to lift some of that steel in place, and he and that that activity that steel's then got to be welded in place and those sort of things. Now he might not have all the technical knowledge to look at that swims and say, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about technically here. But what he should he or she should have the ability to look at is to say, okay, we've got a control in place around our crane. We're using we have a swims for the crane and the crane operators. We have a swims for the guy doing structural steel because he's working above two meters. He's putting controls in place against dropped objects. He's putting controls in place against fall from heights. Now, he may not be completely au okay with all the technical parts of the job, but he should be able to have a common sense approach to look at that swims. And if they've not got an understanding of what's being documented in the swims, the best thing to do is ask. So speak to the person that's prepared the swims and say, can you explain this to me? If they're then not happy that what's being put in place controls the risk, uh, to a reasonably practical sense, then they're quite within their rights to say, no, this work's not going ahead until we get some amendments to this. 
So they still have a duty, A, that it's been prepared, um, and while they may not know all the ins and outs, they should be casting a common sense eye across it. And that, that's under that, what's reasonably practical, what should they have knowledge of, and how, how those hazards normally identified and controlled. That makes sense. Uh, thank you for that, Rick. Um, Tony's just asked this one uh, around a swims. Noting the swims template, it has a cell saying, date swims provided to principal contractor. Does this imply that the principal contractor needs to vet the swims before work starts? Uh, what they need to do is ensure it's been prepared prior to the work commencing. So in a lot of cases, that might just be that the subcontractor will say, I've sent this via email on this date, they'll sign it and date it to that and send it through. So it's a bit of the due diligence to show that they've taken that uh, step to provide it to the principal contractor. And the principal contractor in some cases may also be the person um, writing, preparing and undertaking the swims. So it's sometimes it's going to be a little bit difficult to say implement because if I'm the principal contractor and I've written the swims while I've provided to myself on the same date, so you just go bang and fill those in in that way. Uh, it's a way for the principal contractor to then have a record that it's been provided and for the contractor to then say, I have provided it, which is in line with what they need to do. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, this one around, uh, again, around SWIMS, um, but designated work groups. Do you need to consult with your designated work group prior to implementing SWIMS? If the designated work group is available, there's a health and safety representative on site, usually they would be involved with the preparation or the vetting of the SWIMS. So if that's in place, and, and we recommend that you know workplaces do have designated work groups and health and safety representatives, but we also understand that on a lot of smaller sites that, that they are not in place and in many ways they're not practicable or as practical in those instances. So uh, wherever possible, yes, it would be great if they are consulted and involved, but it shouldn't be to a point that it becomes a process that means that trying to get a swims up for something that's uh, a fairly what we call a bread and butter type of um, activity uh, gets delayed by weeks and weeks because then that's not reasonably practical and it's starting to take away from the likelihood of people doing the right thing and having that swims in place. Great, thank you. Um, this next question I think is around all the different scenarios uh, perhaps people face on site. Um, can contractors work under a principal swims or do they need their own? What if they are working in a mixed crew with both these resources on site? Okay. And look, this is not an uncommon uh, situation. So quite often a principal contractor will have a set of swims and they may, as an example, have a set of swims around controls for working above two metres because they know they're going to have multiple crews in there. And so they'll get each of their crews to sign onto that swims that they're going to, and it, it may have things like we're not going to, have, we have, you know, there'll be a scaffold in place and that can only be altered by suitably qualified and licensed people. The contractor themselves may, would also have within their swims one that talks about a control being in place. They turn up and the control's in place, they, they can begin work. If they can, the principal contractor and the contractor both have that, and they turn up to the site and that control is not in place, then same thing happens. The work stops until that swims can be implemented properly. This one, uh, an interesting one here, Rick. Um, now that construction is back in Victoria, post-COVID restrictions, are you seeing any new high-risk hazards emerging? Uh, unfortunately, we're not seeing any new ones, Cameron. We're just seeing the same old ones. Um, and... Uh, and being brutally honest, we, we've had a spate of falls in Victoria in recent times, and in a couple of those cases, at least, there's been lack of fall control in place. Now, had a swims been done and uh, controls implemented, then those incidents may not have occurred. The other thing around that is that there are some industry pressures and, and we do recognise that, uh, that there are things like extended lead times for getting fall protection at the moment, where it used to be two to three weeks, it can be out six to seven weeks. 
And that's partly because of um, restrictions and uh, trouble for builders to get labour and also to get material. So where a scaffold may have sat on a site for um, six to eight weeks, it may now be sitting there from 12 to 14 weeks. And so that creates a bit of scarcity in the industry. So that really then comes back to the contractors and their planning and saying, all right, how do we forward plan more so that we give more notice so that we can have those things in place if it's things that we need to bring in to make a site safe? It's sad, isn't it, that, that time pressure can often cause uh, those same accidents happening again and again. Yeah. Um, this one here from, uh, from Jimmy uh, asked, as an employer... How do I know what control measures are deemed reasonably practicable? That sounds like a nice technical question. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, it is what we'd be looking at, and I would certainly refer straight back to the Act, and Section 20 of the Act talks about what's reasonably, what reasonable practicability is. And it's a bit of the things that I discussed earlier. So what should reasonably know, be known about this type of activity? What are the hazards that... Uh, usual and likely to occur around that particular activity? What are the type of things that can be put in place to reduce harm? Uh, what knowledge and information is available? And quite often just a quick Google search will say uh, handrail and you'll get 20 supplies of handrail and different ways of doing handrail, just as one example. So what information is available? And then the last one, of course, is what's the cost to implement it um, and the timeliness? So we want it to be there in a timely fashion. Uh, and if there's got to be a little bit of a delay and a little bit of extended cost, as long as that's deemed to be reasonably practicable, and to be honest, if you're going to have somebody working at height, I'm always going to think it's reasonably practicable to have a handrail in place, as an example. So taking shortcuts or not doing that activity, um, or, sorry, not putting those controls in place, uh, isn't an acceptable outcome in probably, uh, well, I'll say most cases. So it's rare that there can't be something done to control the risk of the activity being undertaken. Great. Thank you for that, Rick. There are so many more questions here in front of me. I apologise to all of those questions, uh, questioners that I uh, won't be able to get to your question. Uh, we do keep them all on record and uh, and have them, and, uh, and a lot of the team will go through them and check if there's anything in there that uh, really needs to be followed up in a hurry. Um, hopefully, uh, we've given out a lot of information today to perhaps uh, give some answers to some of those questions, but I really appreciate everyone who's asked. Uh, and Rick, thank you to you for explaining how safe work method statements can provide a systematic process of evaluation and managing the potential risks that may be involved in an activity. Absolutely vital, as you've mentioned, if you are to keep workers safe in high-risk construction work. Rick, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Cameron. Really appreciate you joining us. Well, we hope that everyone has found this an interesting and informative session. Going by the questions, I think you have. Uh, this webinar will be available online via WorkSafe's website in the next month or so so that you can view it at any time and just check up any of the information that you might be a little bit unsure of. We love feedback here at WorkSafe. We, a survey will be sent out in the next few weeks. We'd really appreciate if you filled in that survey and gave us some feedback so that we can keep aiming to improve health and safety month. We can keep aiming to improve those messages that are getting out there to keep people safe in the workplace. There's an opportunity to win a prize as well. We'll be giving away five $100 gift vouchers. Winners will be notified at the end of November via email or phone number, depending on what you've supplied. So really appreciate it if you could fill in those surveys for us. Uh, we'll make a note on the screen shortly to some of the contacts that we've talked about today that you may find helpful if you're required to create a safe work method statement. If you have any requests for further information, we recommend you to please get in touch. And remember, if there is something you want to discuss urgently when you're at work, please contact the WorkSafe advisory line and don't forget the emergency line is open 24 seven. So please use it. If in doubt, please get in contact. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you again in one of the webinars starting shortly. Thank you.